It's an amazing account throughout scriptures of, of God's desire and God's continual wooing of his people and God's continual wooing of his creation to draw them into relationship with him and draw them into the, his presence where he can minister to them. And he doesn't force his will upon anybody. He will not force himself on us, but he allows us then. He'll lay in front of us choices and allow us then to choose by our own volition and choose of our own understanding which way we're going to go, which way we're going to walk, whether we're going to walk after our own mind, after our own flesh, or whether we choose to walk in relationship with him. And it's God's desire and it's God's plan and he's the one that created it that we walk in a relationship, in a covenant type relationship to him. So when we choose to commit and purposely pour ourselves into that relationship, God, there's a term that we'll use and it's called a covenant. God will enter into covenant with his people. Those that choose to walk with him and to follow after his will and his plan. So uh, unfortunately there's too many that choose to walk after their own Lust, to walk after their own flesh, to walk after their own ways. And Adam and Eve were the first. They're certainly not the last, but they were first to understand the consequences of not walking in God's commandment. The very first to understand. And they were the very first of God's creation to experience what we're all familiar with and what the rest of, of creation has, has experienced, and that's guilt. They were the first ones to experience and understand what guilt. And when they experienced that guilt, they expected something to happen, and they expected to die. The pronouncement was clear in Genesis 2 and 17. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And when they felt that guilt that they had, they, they tried of their own volition to cover it up. They tried to hide from God. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And yet they understood that the results of their guilt and results of their disobedience would bring about death. While they didn't physically die that day, there was something that happened in a relationship that they had with God and something that happened in the covenant that God desired to have with His people and that covenant died. But for the mercies of God, they didn't physically die. And there were two good reasons why they didn't die. First reason is God is merciful. Aren't you glad for a merciful God that when He sees you in your condition, He doesn't pronounce judgment upon us? When He sees us in our sins, when He sees us in our vileness, and He sees us in the condition that our hearts and minds are in, that He, he doesn't, he, but He's merciful. He, and He's kind to us. And the second reason why they didn't die that day, the first being mercy, the second one is God is love. It's an unconditional love. And God's love is greater than, than my sins. God's love is greater than my weakness. God's love is greater than my transgression. The love of God is greater than any kind of sin you can commit. God is merciful and He's a God of love. The theme throughout all of Scripture is His mercy and His love towards us. And so God fashioned a plan. And it says in 1 Peter 1 and 18, God fashioned a plan from the very foundation of the world. And it says, for as much as ye know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Silver and gold are precious. I wouldn't mind having a pocket full or I wouldn't mind having a bucket full or, or let's, get, let's get real out of a semi-load of silver and gold. We could all retire if we had thousands of pounds of silver and gold, but that silver and gold's not worth a thing to save my soul. That silver and gold doesn't amount to anything like the blood of Jesus, like the love of God, like His mercy that saves us. We might be able to live in a fancy house and drive a big car with silver and gold, but I'd rather be saved. So we're not saved by our vain tradition, our vain conversation to receive I got that all mixed up from, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest these last times for you. I thank God that from the very beginning he knew that there would, if Adam and Eden hadn't sinned, you would have. If they hadn't have been first, I would have been first. If, it had, if they hadn't have been them, it would have been me. And I thank God that he looked down through the ages and through time and realized that when he breathed into them a breath of life, he would also have to breathe his last breath of life. 
He knew the cost that it would be for fellowship and the cost that it would be for mankind to enter into covenant relationship with him would be the very last breath of a man on hanging on a cross. I thank God for his mercy. I thank God for his love. And I thank God that it wasn't silver and gold or vain traditions, but it's the precious blood of a lamb from, slain from the foundation of the world. When he breathed that breath in, he knew the price that it was going to pay, that he would breathe his last breath as a man. Thank God for him. So Adam and Eve weren't alone in their sins. They weren't alone in their transgressions. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul, in that writing, indicted the entire, uh, the entire uh, humanity in that statement alone, is that, the, that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ has always been a certainty from the very foundations of the world. There's a certainty in God's plans that God is mercy is universal. God is mercy to whosoever will let him call upon the name of the Lord. God's mercy is extended and a covenant relationship is extended to whosoever will let him call upon the name of the Lord. And it's possible for each one, even in the Old Testament time, it was possible for that mercy to be extended to them. There was a time in history when people relied upon, they, they relied less upon a legal contract. Let's do that. There, there are times in, in the world that we live in today, they'll write up a legal contract, and there's lawyers with sharp minds and, and, and twisted minds, maybe, that will write up a contract and word it in one way that they know they can squeeze a way out of it if they have to. There's a time, but there was a time in, in, in the history of mankind where it was not some kind of legal document that bound them, but it was, it was your name. It was a handshake, and it was a name that was enough. Your name and a handshake was enough to represent who you were. It was enough to represent your character. It was enough to represent maybe your stature, maybe your authority, uh, uh, just simply by your name. And people honored their names, and people honored the authority that came with a name. If you had the name of, of, uh, of King David, that held more authority than, than the name of John did. Or it had more authority, but it was in a time in the history of man where your name was important. And that's where I want to dwell on here a little bit this morning today, is that our name represents something. Our character, our status, our authority, the trust that we have. And so that it's no surprise to us then that God used His name to represent a covenant relationship with mankind, that he used his own name whenever he exacted, exacted a relationship that he wanted to have with man, he used the name of the Lord God Almighty. And there's a number of places through scripture where he gives descriptive names, Jehovah, Yahweh, Jehovah, Sidkenu, and all of the different names that he uses. But I want to look at it in, in the... Uh, in the Old Testament, the usual translation for the name of the Lord or God was sometimes Jehovah in the English translations of it. Yet originally the word was, was translated and it would have been in the Hebrew, it would have been Yahweh. And they left out the vowels and it was such an important name that it was rare, that it wasn't spoken. And that it wasn't actually, but it was the, the power was in the name. And it wasn't until the, Moses that God revealed the meaning the glory, the authority, the, the redemptive power demonstrated by delivering Israel from Egypt. And it was in his name. Let's go to Exodus chapter number 3. And verse number 14 he says, And God said unto, Mo unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am have sent me Unto you, there was a there was something there in, in the fact that God used His own name. They want to know how how will they know to believe? How will they know to follow? How will they know? And He said, that "I am that I am." He gave them the authority and the of His name and the importance of His name and to call upon the name. Let's read the next verse, fifteen. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. If there was going to be any kind of authority to deliver them, any kind of authority to set them free, any kind of authority to bring them out of bondage, it was going to, they could trust in it, they could lean on it, they could hold to it, they would know it's going to happen because it was done in the authority of the name of the Almighty God. It was done in the authority of the name 
I am that I am, hath sent you. And no greater promise could we have than the authority of the name of the one that's going to deliver us. Let's look in verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I surely have visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. So he gave a provision and he gave a promise that you will be delivered. I will set you free. I will deliver the captive. I will bring you into promise. I will bring you into covenant because I've given you. I am that I am. I'm the God of your fathers. I'm the almighty God. I'm the creator of all the heavens and the earth. And because I am who I am, the promise is true. I thank God that we have that promise in who He is and that we can stand firmly upon a foundation of His Word and stand firmly on a foundation of the covenant of His name, in Jesus' name. And so God called Israel. He's the one that called them into covenant. He called them into that covenant in Mount Sinai in verse number 1 of Exodus 20. He said, God spake all these words saying... I'm not turning to it. I'm reading it off the board too here. So I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And even as Moses received the law, even as he stood in front of them and told them, I am the God that delivered you. I am the God that brought you out. I am the God who will save you from, from your enemies. Even as Moses received the promise on the mountaintop, even as Moses was receiving the covenant that God desired to have with his people, what were they up to? Dancing around a golden calf. They rebelled in the worship of a golden calf, and yet Moses, as a mediator, when God told him, look what these people are doing, look what they're doing, Moses stood as a mediator between God and man, and he asked and he told God of the mercy and reminded God of his mercy and reminded God of the covenant that he had established with them and the word that was spoken to them before and and the word that was spoken to them before in their before they wandered into this kind of a sin God had already establishment I am that I am hath come to save you and he established a covenant with them and Moses reminded them of that and so God spoke his let's look in Exodus 34 and verse 5 and 7 The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and the third and fourth generations. God had established a covenant with his people, and he wasn't willing to break it because of their sins. I thank God that he's merciful. I thank God that he's a God of love. And I thank God that he's willing. and, And there's correction that came. There was correction that came. There was a consequence for the sins, but God maintained his covenant covenant by his word and by his name. And in Numbers chapter 6, God gave the priests authority to call upon his name in a covenant relationship. In chapter 6, verse 23 through 27, he said, Speak unto Aaron to his son, saying, In this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee. They're calling on the name of the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Again, he gave the priesthood and he gave them the authority to call upon his name. Call upon my name. Call upon me when you ask a blessing. Call upon me when you give a sacrifice. Call upon my name when you stand before the people. And let them know that it's not just the ministry, but it's a covenant relationship that I've given you. And you have the authority to use my name when when you receive an offering. And authority to use my name when you 
you pronounce? Uh, so, so thus they invoke. God gave the priesthood the ability to, in his name to invoke that name. And to invoke in that name, they would also bring in the very presence of God into their midst. When the fire fell down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. When they called upon that name, there was a presence of God in that place. I'm thankful that when we call upon the name of the Lord, we lift up our hands. We lift up our voice. Uh, we lift up the name of Jesus. I have very expectation that the presence of God is in our midst. It's not in vain that we call upon His name. And it's not in vain that He give us the authority of His name. But when we call that name, we have an expectation that His presence will be in our midst. And I thank God for that. And that's what He gave into the Old Testament priesthood. is that They called upon the name of the Lord. And there was an expectation that the presence of God would be there. And so I thank God that that covenant relationship wasn't just with Israel alone. But a number of prophets saw the day when God's, when the Gentile world would also be called into covenant relationship. The last four verses of the book, I didn't give this to them, but the last four verses of the book of Amos, chapter number 9, saw a restoration and a time when he would restore the David's uh, uh, covenant with David that he had with the people of Israel under the Messiah. But let's look in Jeremiah 31. And it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. And what a great covenant he made with their fathers. And he gave them the authority of his word. And he gave them the promise of a, of a land flowing with milk and honey. He gave them a promise to overcome their enemies and to tear down walls and tear down strongholds. And, and to live in prosperity and to live in a land of promise. He gave them that kind of authority. But he said for us today, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break, though I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. What a promise he has and they shall teach it no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sins no more. I thank God today that that relationship is just not confined to the, to the people of Israel, but that God gave a promise that He's going to write His law in our hearts. And He gave us a promise of a name that's above every other name. Hallelujah. And so a number of the prophets saw that day and they foretold it. Jeremiah foretold of it. Amos foretold of it. But also in the book of Joel that was preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. And it says, I will... In Joel 2 and 28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. God had given a promise of a covenant relationship with a people even past the Israelites, but that would be given to all men everywhere. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank God. And so on the birthday... Excuse me, but Messiah was brought new covenant and hope of, of an universal salvation. The angel told Joseph to name the baby Jesus, for he will save their people from their sins. And the Bible is clear that in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 19, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, hath committed unto us the word of, of reconciliation. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He gave us a name that was above every other name. It was Jesus in Acts 4, 4 and 12 that said, Neither is there salvation in any other name. God gave him his name, I am that I am, and gave him the promise. But God has given us a promise of a name. Neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Call upon the name of Jesus to be saved. Call upon the name of Jesus for deliverance. Call upon the name of Jesus for your needs. In Jesus' name, And there's no salvation in any other name. And so on the birthday of the New Testament church, the name of Jesus was not only, but it was linked together. And we can put the two together with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. Peter preached the fulfillment the fulfill, 
He preached the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in, in 2 and 28 that we read earlier in Acts number 2. Verse 17, it will come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God wants us to have a name, a covenant relationship established in the name of who that he is today. Hallelujah. So his prophecy was preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. and, And so... Theologically, and and we won't take time to do it here today, but calling upon the name of the Lord is equivalent to, and if we had time, I'd love to do it, but is equivalent to calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus in water baptism. When they call upon the name of the Lord and saved, it's, it's... It's the equivalent to calling upon his name in water baptism. The understanding then is, let, let's look in chapter number 15. The understanding then is substantiated in Acts 15 when the question arose. There was a question then that came up among them whether these converts of Paul's, the Gentile converts, if they were truly in covenant relationship with God because they didn't keep the Torah, because they weren't of the household of Israel, they weren't of the stock of Israel, they weren't part of that heritage and it was questioned then that arose amongst the, the apostles and amongst the people then if, if they were truly converts, if they were truly a part of the covenant relationship because they, they couldn't trace back some kind of a lineage. But let's read it, excuse me, in chapter 15, verse 7 through 18. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brother, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And that would be back when Cornelius came and and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And God, which know the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers... Go back, I didn't finish it. (laughs) <laughs> Neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. <coughs> but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude gave silence or kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And they hear where James stands up and begins to clarify it for them. And after they held their peace, after they were witness to all of the things God did to them, that Barnabas and Paul gave testimony that how the gift of the Holy Ghost was poured upon them and how the miracles of God were worked amongst the Gentiles, James answered and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. And if you'll read those last four verses of the ninth chapter, the very last part of the book of Amos, it talks about restoring the tabernacle of David. That's that's what it was referencing to is the very last part of Amos where he prophesied that God was going to restore it and that the gifts uh, and that God would call the Gentiles to repentance and that God would call the Gentiles out of out of the world so that he could pour his spirit out upon them also. That that's what he's referencing to is Amos chapter number six. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So again, he gave reference to the fact that when God poured out his spirit upon the Gentiles, it was done in his name. They gave reference to his name. And God gave authority to use his name. And God gave us the power of his name to be able to call out upon them. So it wasn't just through the name of Jesus 
that, that it was given to them. It wasn't just through the name, but it was also coupled together with the outpouring of the gift of the Holy Ghost being poured out upon them. Acts 11, 15 through 18. And the gospel records also in, in the gospels the proclamation that John the Baptist proclaimed also the same thing. He says, and as it began to speak, and the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And all four Gospels give reference to this, that John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he that comes after me is greater than I that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's the, that's the reference that he's speaking to. Then remember that. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And in Acts 1 and 5, it says that for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And so in that proclamation that we had in, in, in the 11th, that John also gave proclamation that I baptize you with water, but there's one that's mightier than I whose name is above every name. And so in Acts chapter number 2, it's the culmination of all of the Old Testament and gospel promises we find in Acts chapter 2. Pre Peter proclaimed to a, a, quite a host of people and a crowd of every nation and kindred and tongues. He proclaimed to the crowd that was assembled. He began to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. And he also proclaimed their guiltiness for their, for their crucifixion of who he was. And the crowd recognizing what Peter was preaching, they were remorseful, and they were sorry, and they, they were broken, and they were contrite. And they asked this very question, acknowledged that they were complicit in their killing of Christ. He said, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what are we going to do? What can we do? What are we going to do? And it's the same question we can ask ourselves when I find myself in a position where I recognize who I am and find myself in a place where I recognize who I am in light of eternity and recognize who I am in light of the presence of God that's revealed to us. What are we going to do? And, Paul, and Peter was quick to give him an answer and he said to repent. To turn away from your sins, to turn away from your sorrow, to turn away from the things that have, have left you broken and downtrodden. And turn away from the things that will separate you from the presence of God. What do we do when we recognize the authority of who He is and the covenant that He's desiring to have with us as we repent and turn towards Him and we're baptized in the, every one of us in the name of Jesus Christ? He couples together that name again, that covenant relationship that we can have with Him is in the name of Jesus. And He attaches to that, the, theologically attaches to that, the, that we will be filled with the Holy Ghost to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and I'm so thankful today that God will give us the gift of the Holy Ghost they ask what do we do repent when we find out who we are we repent we call upon the name of the Lord the same covenant relationship that he established in the Old Testament is calling upon the name of the Lord I am that I am has sent thee I've come to deliver you. I've come to set you free from your bondage. I've come to deliver you out of the land of Egypt. They call upon the name of the Lord and, he, and walk through on dry ground. Water poured out of a rock. All the promises of his word that he would give them a land flowing with milk and honey. All of those same promises of a relationship with God are for us today if we'll repent and call upon his name in water baptism, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And it wasn't just limited to Jerusalem, but to all, whosoever will, the promise to you, to your children, all that are afar off, even the Gentiles, even the ones that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So their subsequent chapters in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost continued to be poured out. Chapter 10, chapter 15, all of the subsequent. And consequently, what happened then, when the people received the Holy Ghost, what they spake in tongues. And, and ye shall receive. So uniformly, 
did it happen? So uniformly can we look and see that when it happened, that they spoke in tongues, that when it happened to the Gentiles, and when it was poured out upon them, they saw that they also spoke in tongues, then they didn't doubt it. Because they heard them, as it says in Acts 10 and 46, they heard them speak with tongues and glorify God. They called upon the name of the Lord in in covenant relationship, called upon the name of the Lord, were baptized in Jesus' name and received the same gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as we all did, as they all did in, in Jerusalem on that first day. So covenant relationship is both in continuity with and yet greater than anything possible in the Old Testament. And what how wonderful it was in the Old Testament, the covenant that God established to bring His people out, the covenant that, that He established to, to bring them into a land of promise. And, but it's not the name of Yahweh. It's not the name of Jehovah, but it's the name of Jesus that's involved in relationship with us today. It's initiated, that covenant relationship with the name of Jesus is initiated in us by water baptism in Jesus' name. And we don't just receive a spirit of God in part like they had there in the Old Testament. But we receive a covenant relationship with Jesus. We receive rivers of living water. We receive the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in us. We receive all of the power and the authority of who our God is. Not just the priesthood that called down the presence of God. Not just the priesthood that we're able to use a name. But each and every one of us then can operate with a full and complete covenant relationship with our God. I have the authority to call down the power of God from heaven. I have the authority to pray for the sick and see them recovered. You have the authority in the name of Jesus to see the sick recovered. To see the lame walk, the blind eyes to be opened. To see every need that we pray for and have an expectation that when we call upon the name of Jesus... I have the expectation of His promise being fulfilled. I have the expectation and the experience and the expectation of all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in us. That we're able to see all of the promise. We're able to operate in the full gifts of the Spirit because of a covenant relationship that we have with with God. I thank God today that He establishes that kind of a relation. It wasn't something we stirred up by our own need. We're all guilty. We've all come short of the grace of God. But God established from the very foundation of the world that we would walk in relationship with Him. And He's fulfilling that relationship in these last days by pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. And so it's not a small thing to be adopted into the family of God, to live in full and certain relationship with Him. If we understood the importance of it and how deep it actually goes and how much God, it, it, how much God is imparting to us today. He created it all. He built it all. He spoke it all into existence. And He desires for us to have authority and desires for His church to have dominion. And desires for His people to have also, it's called the rest, wherewith cause the weary to rest. He desires us that, come what may, I still have a confidence. I, I've been in a place in my life where the, world, where the world fell apart around me. But when I called upon the name of the Lord, I knew what it meant to enter into a relationship with God that takes away all the guilt of sin, that takes away all the hurt that the world has, that takes away all of the all of the punishment that's due for our sins and brings us into a relationship where I can rest, where I can have peace, that I know I can have a purpose that only God can give us. We have a promise in His Word and a promise in His name. And so a new covenant relationship is made possible. Living in covenant with God is possible because of the work of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for that today. Will you stand with me today? We're done a little bit early. Let's lift up our hands today and give thanks to God and and, and give thanks for the understanding today that we walk in a, a relationship with Him and a covenant relationship with Him. 
And that all of His promises, the authority of His name, the authority of His power can be imparted into us, into the church, and each and every one of our lives. You have the authority to call upon the name of the Lord. It's not restricted to the ministry. It's not restricted to the priesthood. But each one of us baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost uh, can call down on the authority in the name of Jesus and call down on the authority of His Word and have all of His promises fulfilled in us today. We thank you today, God. We thank you for that relationship that you've made, that new covenant relationship, God, that you created in us, Lord, by your work of Calvary on the cross, uh, by the outpouring of your Spirit upon our lives, God. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Uh, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, God, for all the promises are yea and amen in Him. And all the promises of your word, God, are in the church and in the bride and in the body of Christ. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm so thankful to be able to know and understand the relationship that we have and that we walk with Him in the full and complete covenant and authority of who He is. You're dismissed today in Jesus' name. Greet one another. Be nice. Amen. Shake somebody's hand. Prove you still got a friend. Say something nice to somebody. Except Troy. <laughs>